The economy for which, as the mainstream media have been telling me for months and months, Barack Obama is solely responsible and Donald Trump is not in any way responsible, has tanked. We will analyze why stocks are down and, most importantly, who to blame. Then, it's our 100th episode. To celebrate, we'll be using Daily Wire's incredible streaming technology to interview future me, Michael, from the 200th episode. Boy, that is, that is going to be great. I can't wait to see how incredible our show looks by the 200th episode. Marshall, isn't that going to be great? Yeah. I can't, can't wait. Then Amanda Prestigiacomo and Josh Yasma join the panel of deplorables to discuss Harvard's banning all single gender clubs except for the female ones. Equality. Hashtag equality. We will also discuss the English teacher who was fired and reported to a counterterrorism agency for telling a lesbian student that God loves her. And finally, satanic yoga. Then, because all nature is but art unknown to thee, this day in history is both Ronald Reagan's birthday and 73 years later, the day that the Gipper announced the Reagan Doctrine. We will cover it all. I am Michael Knowles, and this is The Michael Knowles Show. There is a lot to get to today, especially me interviewing me from the 200th episode. That's going to be pretty wild. I've never seen something like that before. I wonder how much bigger our studio gets. It'd be nice to get out of this broom closet. We'll probably even be on network television by then. So we'll, we'll get to that right away, but not before we talk about man crates. Man crates are, you know, I talk about man crates all the time. I love them. I have several man crates products in my pocket right now to light up my stogies and probably, probably a whiskey glass in there too, just from last night bumbling around. Man crates is excellent. So Valentine's Day is coming up. Giving your guy a box of chocolates for Valentine's Day is so, so boring. You should surprise him with a heart-shaped box of delicious beef jerky, the ultimate snaphrodisiac. I can tell you, look, I've tried everything. I've tried oysters on the half shell. I've tried some of the medicines. Nothing puts me in the right mood for the boudoir quite like a heart-shaped box of beef jerky and a snaphrodisiac. Uh, that brings us to mancrates.com, which is the only place to find awesome gifts that men will love. This isn't a cologne thing or a cheesy mug. Man Crates offers curated gift collections for every type of guy, from the sports fanatic to the home chef to the outdoorsman. I'm none of those guys, but I do like whiskey and cigars, and they have two separate, actually multiple Man Crates, uh, j even just for those, but they have a lot of really good ones. They have the classics, like the NFL Barware Crate, the Whiskey Appreciation Crate, they have fresh takes on traditional Valentine's gifts, like the jerky heart or the salami bouquet. That's actually how sweet little Elisa proposed to me. She got down on one knee, offered me a salami bouquet. I was hers forever. Uh, go to mancrates.com, pick the perfect gift, then wait for that magic moment. He will fall head over heels when this gift arrives. And the way it comes, you might have seen this. I had a little trouble opening it, you know, because I'm not the most beefcakey Adonis that's walking around. And so the man crate comes, and I got mine gift wrapped, which means they put it in a lot of duct tape. Then they give you a crowbar and you have to open it up and pry open the crate and then you get all of the cool stuff that's inside. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. If you can't do it, if you have some trouble, you go to the help page and it says try harder, which is good advice. Good advice for everything in life. So uh, you've got to check it out. It's really fun. Mo I talk about this a lot. Giving a gift is usually much less about the gift than, than the relationship. I gave this to you. This is a thing we share. Oh, yes, Johnny gave me this so-and-so, right? And the experience of opening this gift is really, really fun. Uh, they have thousands of five-star reviews. Every gift comes with a complete satisfaction guarantee. So what can you do? Don't say I never did anything for you. Go to mancrates.com slash Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S, as in Sam, for 5% off. They do not offer this discount anywhere else, so get 5% off right now at mancrates.com slash Knowles. What is it, Marshall? Mancrates.com slash Knowles. Slash Knowles. Go get it. It's a lot of fun. Okay. To celebrate our 100th episode, we are lucky enough to be joined by a no doubt illustrious guest. He was not easy to find, but through our state of the art daily wire technology, we are going to speak with Michael from the 200th episode. Do we have him? Let's bring on future Michael. <coughs> Michael, Michael, is that you? M Michael, Michael. Not again, buddy, not again. I'm not doing that again for less than $20. Cash, I don't care. Ah! Is that me? 
Yeah, Michael, it's me. It's me from the hundredth episode. I can't hear you that well. Holy! How much coffee did I smoke? Am I dead? Oh, finally! Oh, finally! Yes! Yes! Oh, yeah. Thank you, you merciful! Oh, no more of this hell! This hell I walk through day by day! Oh, thank you! Michael. Michael, you're not dead. Michael, uh, Michael, I am you from the 100th episode. Are you, are you doing some kind of shoot for the 200th episode? <laughs> The 200th episode. Am I do? Did you think Shapiro would let you get to 200? <laughs> I guess I'm not the only one puffing on fifth. No, you didn't make it to 200 episodes. 200 episodes. What do you mean I didn't make it to 200 episodes? Are you? I, oh, oh, Michael. Oh, you stupid, swarthy lout. You, you thought you made it. Well, uh, here's an idea. How about you have some your stupid sketches? You got a podcast about politics. People want to hear about politics and culture and history. But no, you wear your stupid sweaters and your stupid bow ties and you're all the little panel I, I, of uh, beautiful women. Yeah, that it looks like, our, uh, looks like the feed is cutting out. Looks like the feed's cutting out. Marshall. Marshall, looks like the feed's cutting out. Uh, all right. Um, let's talk about the economy. Man, was that does 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 future me have alopecia or something like that? It's very that's very scary stuff. Okay, the Dow fell by eleven hundred seventy five points on Monday. Oh no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. The Obama stock market fell by eleven hundred seventy points on Monday. We just got to get we're just going to get fact, fact, fact here. This uh, this is not looking good for the future in the Obama economy. It's the Obama economy, right? President Trump has nothing to do with it. That's what Democrats have been yelling and telling me for a year. So Obama actually handed over a wonderful economy to Trump, a an administration that has done um, not very much to contribute to. Uh, this strong economy. The economy was in a ditch and Barack Obama pulled it out the ditch, shined it up, put us back on the road uh, and t- took us to another level. Donald Trump is riding the wave of the success of President Obama. He has <laughs> done nothing to contribute to the success of the economy right now. Works for me. But if, unlike Democrats, I'm being honest, the story is more complicated. The Dow fell 1,175 points yesterday. The market sell-off began last week. It sped up on Monday, which affected global markets. Yesterday's drop was the single largest uh, day drop in the Dow's history. The S&P 500 had its worst day in seven years. Market volatility has been accelerating in recent months, jumping by more than 100%. Japan's Nikkei dropped 4.7%. That was its largest single day drop since Brexit. Markets in Hong Kong, Europe, and the UK also tanked. Then this morning, the Dow dropped another 500 points. Uh, $4 trillion was wiped away from global markets yesterday. Bitcoin is down to around $7,000 after hitting nearly $20,000 in December. I know it's shocking that a thing that's completely fake and made up has c- crashed. <laughs> uh, so more importantly, whose fault is it? Well, I am more than happy to follow the lead of Democrat hacks on TV and start calling this the Obama economy. But the situation is much more complicated. And with any complex system like the U.S. economy or the global economy for that matter, the president has some influence. The, pre, uh, the previous president has some influence, and on many counts, the president has nothing to do with it. So, of course, President Trump has been touting the record market highs since he's been in office. This is understandable, but ultimately, it's not a great strategy, because if you take credit when the market soars, you're going to have a more difficult time explaining why it's not your fault when the market tanks. Uh, I spoke to some friends of mine in the upper echelons of high finance, or as I am told to pronounce it, finance, finan- uh, in, uh, in high finance. Uh, their expert analysis of the market drop is that nobody has any idea what's going on. <laughs> That's the best <laughs> they can give me. <laughs> Sounds about right, you know, because financial analysts are like sports analysts and political analysts. They have no idea what's happening, and most of their predictions are wrong, and then they just keep showing up to work, and people keep listening to them <laughs> for some reason. So... 
There is one theory that's interesting. There's one theory that there are a bunch of short volatility strategies that are driven by algorithms. So when uh, prices prices fall abruptly, that actually triggers more selling. So uh, it it uh, becomes a self fulfilling uh, prophecy and feeds on itself, and it gets you uh, crazy drops like we saw yesterday. So in this sense, we can't really blame Obama or Trump. Artemis Capital Management explains it like a snake eating its own tail. So in extreme heat, a snake's metabolism will spike out of control. And in this mania, it will be unable to differentiate between its tail and food. So it starts eating itself until it dies. Like this, in a market where both stocks and bonds are overvalued, a feedback loop of very, very low interest rates, debt expansion, asset volatility, and financial engineering will cause volatility to reinforce itself both lower and higher. Uh, it's too bad that we don't have one of those precious metal companies right now that's sponsoring the show. <laughs> Guess we would be selling precious metals like gangbusters, but sad, missed opportunity. What can we do? Donald Trump certainly gets credit for certain aspects of the economy. He gets credit for consumer confidence. He gets credit for the repatriation of corporate funds held overseas, uh, for cutting the corporate tax rate to make the U.S. competitive. Uh, he gets credit for economic growth at levels that Barack Obama's own economists said were impossible. Donald Trump gets credit for those things. Even the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, admits as much. A couple of weeks ago, the Wall Street Journal pulled 68 business, financial, and academic economists as to whether Trump gets credit for the strong economy. The majority of them agreed that he does. Uh, that said, markets correct themselves. This happens. Analysts have been predicting this for a long time. Uh, HSBC says the correct, correction is long overdue. The S&P was up 8% in January. That doesn't go on forever, I'm sorry to say. You aren't going to get 8% a month for the next 11 months. Uh, the Dow's fall on Friday was an ominous 666 points. Probably not a good sign. Wharton professor Jeremy Siegel actually thinks the correction could be a good thing. Even up to a 10% fall, we still won't have a bear market in 2018, he says. And that would be good because we need to get through more months, uh, about, what, eight more months now, of uh, at least the appearance of a strong economy, or else the perception will become the reality of electing Democrats. I promise you that will not be good for the economy. So let's talk some news with the panel. That's on the markets. I wanted to just uh, break that down a little bit because we're going to be hearing a lot of ridiculous partisan nonsense from, on both sides of the aisle for, for uh, a little bit. And I at least want you to know I want you to have some honest partisan nonsense. I want you to know where your propaganda comes from, honestly. So we have the lovely Amanda Presta Giacomo and the decidedly less lovely Josh Yasma. Thank you both for being here. Uh, the first question, Harvard University has banned all gender exclusive clubs on and off campus, except for the female ones, but all of the other ones. For instance, they have banned the male organizations and they've banned the men's clubs and the, the guys' groups they banned, and the fellas' lodges, all of those are banned. Uh, it's just the female ones that aren't. Uh, the move hits fraternities, but really it's directed toward Harvard's final clubs. This is kind of like the secret societies at Yale, and it's these prestigious clubs. I actually have some experience of Harvard's final clubs. I was uh, not allowed into one during my junior year of college. Uh, we were up in Cambridge for the game, and I drank a lot of Four loco when that was still legal, a lot of caffeine and malt liquor or something, and I repeatedly blew a vuvuzela into some Harvard guy's face, and then they wouldn't let me into their club. So this is karma, guys. This is what you get for not letting me in, as far as I'm concerned. Amanda, women are allowed to keep their clubs, but men are not. The logic here is that Harvard men have privilege, true, but uh, women enrolled at the oldest university in the United States. Harvard women somehow do not have privilege. Uh, this seems to tie in a little bit with the narrative here that men are predators who must be castrated and all women are victims. A poll shows 31% of female Harvard students claim to have been sexually assaulted on campus. Whatever that means, whatever sexual assault is, mm -hmm. is, means to say. What is going on here? Is Harvard Yard more dangerous for women than downtown Fallujah? <laughs> that, that's what those studies would tell you. But as we've seen time and again, a lot of those studies are super broad and ambiguous. Like, for instance, if you had sex and then you regretted it the next day, that would count as you being sexually assaulted or, you know, rape. So uh, there's, there are endless people. I know George Will did a really good piece on this, just debunking a lot of those um, surveys. So, mm -hmm. no, that's not the case. And, and by the uh, way, that's if that's totally the case, then then if regret constitutes a sexual assault, then Josh is got to be the most wanted man in <laughs> the over. entire country. Yeah. I'm sorry. I finished <laughs> your point, Amanda. 
yeah, so so you can't you can't look at those um, uh, surveys um, with any objectivity. Um, and then also, it's just funny to see this. Th this is like the status of feminism today is that it's like cafeteria style feminism. So you know we're exactly the same. We're, you know, uh, there's no difference between men and women. Um, so, you know, we're going to have all these policies that you know, there is no difference. So there can't be a man's only club, a woman's only club. But at the same time, um, we, we want the women's club because we want special treatment. Like it, it's like really patronizing and weird how right. everything's the same. But <laughs> we still get the good stuff. Like we if I, you know, we're in a lower standard so I can fight in combat. But at the same time, I better not be in the draft. So it doesn't make any sense. You kind of just like cafeteria style pick what you want. Um, and that doesn't make any sense. That's why you have to subscribe to real feminism, which is acknowledges that men and women are different, though they can be equal under right. the law. Real feminism, which is anti-feminism, and we need right. it, we need equality so that we can treat people with special privileges, so that we can have more equality or something. Josh, Barack Obama's <laughs> Centers for Disease Control spent a million dollars on a study to reduce rigid masculinity. Now, I'm not suggesting you're an expert on this, but why does the left <laughs> hate men and masculinity. I'm being very mean to Josh today. That's not good. Why does the left hate men and masculinity? Um, well, first of all, I really appreciated your beard in that uh, future segment. <laughs> I knew it was fake because you don't have the capacity to grow Real that kind nice. Of Here we go. He's getting me back. <laughs> um, so as far as rigid masculinity, toxic, ma toxic masculinity, I, I think we need to acknowledge that sexual assault is a problem. You know, there who is, doesn't acknowledge that? <laughs> that? I think we yeah. need to acknowledge well, who, who that murder is, is bad. I yeah, I I agree. I <laughs> we're, well, it's it's a problem on. I don't think that downplaying it helps. And I I think that while these programs may be misguided, um, do, do you think thirty one percent of women at Harvard University have been raped on campus? Does anyone actually believe that? No, I, I can't speak to those stats, um, but I, I Amanda, do you think thirty-one percent of women on Harvard's no, campus and, have and been raped? No, and there's there's harm to playing that stuff up as well. I mean, there's harm to just because then we have you know memos from the Obama administration directing people that you don't really need evidence, right? If someone comes forward, you don't have to tell that person that they've been accused. All we have these kangaroo courts on campus because we overplay this this rape culture nonsense that's backed up by nothing by mm -hmm. these ambiguous uh, surveys. So it's actually it's a danger. We need to go with the actual facts. We, we can't. It's a danger to play this stuff up when it's not really there. That's right. And it, this actually isn't the craziest example from campus, even in today's news cycle. An English teacher, uh, like the country, not like the subject, though she is a subject because she's English. An English teacher <laughs> has been fired and uh, reported to a counterterrorism agency because she had the audacity to uh, answer her students' questions about Christianity. She's now a radicalization threat as she told a lesbian student that God loves her. That's what makes her a terrorist. Amanda, how has God loves us become hate speech? I, I don't know. I mean, th they're in this, in this report, in this write-up, um, apparently there's a, an atheist teacher who discusses his views openly, um, who has said some pretty crazy things. Apparently he showed the children I don't know how old, high school. I think I don't know how old like these these uh, high school these kids are. But he showed them a picture of like a, a naked woman or whatever. He was suspended for three months and now he's back to teaching. And like you know that's just like a slap on the wrist. But if you have a religious person, so you see the extreme bias here, happen to say that they, you know, hold certain views and then tell somebody that God loves them, which apparently is harmful. You know they're out of there. That you know that that's just it's another clear bias. Uh, that we've seen here in the States over and over. And then, of course, it's really strong on college campuses. We've seen that with Ben all the time. Right. And Josh, t on this point, does this show the silliness and maybe the ultimate futility of a hard separation of church and state? Do jihadis and Christian teachers who say God loves you pose an equal threat to the public? So you're talking about the story from the UK, correct? Yes. Where um, she was, you know, she was at a government funded school and she talked about her personal views. On well, she was asked Christianity. about Christianity. She was, yeah. and and well, she answered. She was asked about her personal views. Well, she her she, she is Christian. She, she is Christian, so Christianity is her personal view. Right. I I come from the camp. Maybe you know I, I hate to be a contrarian again, but I come from the camp where I don't think that the teacher should talk about her religious views at a government funded school. 
So but she can't talk about Christianity? Me. She can't talk about the religion of the West? <laughs> Well, she wasn't teaching a segment on Christianity. She was asked, what are your personal views on homosexuality? And she answered. And I don't know if that's appropriate at a government funded school. It, it, so should she have said, I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry, you've asked a question about the Christian sexual ethic. And even though Christianity is the animating force of the West, even though it's the, it is the major world religion, I can't answer that question because if I answer a question about Christianity, the coppers are going to come in and call me a terrorist. That's how I, we should look, run government schools? Look, the straw man, I, I, I agree. I don't think that it sh she should have been reported to a counterterrorism organization. You know, that, that's, that's obviously absurd. But at the same time, you know, if you're teaching math or you're teaching, um, you know, geometry, something else, and someone asks a question about your personal religious beliefs, then I think there's a time and a place for that. And from what I read, it sounded like she um, went on a tangent. And at a time when she didn't she choose to go into tangent, she was subject. asked a question. You know, this is one, and, well, and she said that very hateful statement that uh, God loves lesbians. That hateful, bigoted <laughs> statement. It's a good thing that we didn't have uh, that, that our scientists uh, weren't selected based on their religious views, and our their teachers weren't excluded for being Christian in the beginning of modernity. Because then we wouldn't have had Isaac Newton, we wouldn't have had Kepler, we wouldn't have had Bacon, we wouldn't have had Pascal, we wouldn't we wouldn't have discovered the Big Bang because George Lemaitre was a Catholic priest. That's probably pretty bad. We wouldn't have discovered the human genome. On and on and on. It seems to me a totally false separation <laughs> between. Uh, uh, faith and reason, between light and truth, between uh, church and state. Obviously, uh, England is a, a Christian country. It, there is a church of England. The Queen of England is the head of the church of England. And must we then pretend that the Queen, the head of England and the head of the church of England, reigns over a country that is totally separated from the religion that animates it, that animates the, its laws, that animates its traditions and its institutions? This seems like pie in the sky leftist utopianism. Am I wrong, Josh? I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. I think that, you know, touting the achievements of Western civilization while accurate, you know, it is. No, I'm touting the Christianity by, you know, of the great scientists of the West. The profound Christianity. I, Isaac Newton spent years interpreting scripture. I, I think the modern UK is a very different place than the, you know, the, than the England of years past, you know, and, and That's a true holding statement. up a ceremonial post like the Church of England or the monarchy. The Church of England isn't a ceremonial like, post, it's a church. But they have no political clout. It, it's not It's not the same. You know, the Anglican Church has no political clout. It, it's meaningless. I do think it, it's meaningless, but I do think it also has political clout because the queen runs it. We have to move on to, that. That is, a, that is a good point though, because it has, in many ways, the UK and the Church of England have become husks of their former selves. And Josh may be celebrating, but I'm a little upset about it, man. <laughs> Moving on to this final uh, question. Uh, our pal Matt Walsh, I think we've all seen this article floating around. <laughs> he sent out a tweet and became public enemy number one. Vox.com started writing hit pieces about him. And I don't know, he's out one tweet about how ridiculous yoga is and people lose their minds. Uh, Matt Walsh says that yoga is pagan and that Christians should not do it. Amanda, he's right, isn't he? Yoga is pagan. It relates to Hinduism, it relates to Buddhism and Jainism. The exercise is thoroughly spiritual. Some of the mantras that people repeat during yoga are things that say, I am the universal self or the unit, whatever, right? The whole point of yoga is that you cannot separate the physical from the spiritual. Why do Christians and even atheists indulge this spiritual ritual for their physical exercise? Shouldn't we just all do Pilates or something instead? Uh, I, I pretty much agree with Matt Walsh on everything. I'm very extreme, just like he is open about it. I, you know, I, I know how, how um, hardcore I am. Um, and when I initially saw this because he wrote a full piece on it. And that the comments section on it is, is lit. If you need something to do for Friday night, read that. Um, but I, I was at first, I was like, OK, this is a little extreme. This is like a stretch, you know. But then I read his arguments, and <laughs> lo and behold, I'm just as extreme as Matt Walsh. Um, it, it's <laughs> it's definitely rooted in paganism. And if you, I remember when I was in college, I was on the soccer team, and they made us take a yoga class. And I remember like being uncomfortable because it was so spiritual. Um, mm. There are like it's not like it's totally a, like detached from this. It's not like um, you know like 
things that were pagan in the past that have been transformed into like Christian practices. It's not like that. It still has um, this very like, uh, it's still a, a pagan ritual and it still practices that um, in a lot of these like yoga studios or even if you do it on your own. I mean, a lot of the um, poses and the things you say, like when you when you echo the the, the yogi or whatever um, yeah. is, is, is pagan. So if you... I think his question is, how does this advance your Christianity? How does this bring you closer to the kingdom of God? And if you can't, if, and if it doesn't, then why not choose a different um, exercise? That's right. right? And they do. The they, end of the world, you're going to hell, but. And they do have these different poses. They have the downward dog and the sun salutation yeah, yeah. and the worship ball. And some of them seem a little more uh, demonic than others. Josh, you are a decadent pagan, but at least you're an insightful <laughs> one. Why do atheists embrace this sort of thing? Is the, is the cultural fascination with yoga, uh, to play devil's advocate here, literally devil's advocate in this case, and disagree a bit with, uh, with Amanda, uh, is it possible that the cultural fascination with yoga is a good, if dangerous, phenomenon, in so much as it shows that self-professed atheists and the spiritual but not religious crowd are indeed themselves longing for the spiritual world, longing for the metaphysical world, longing for God? I don't think that it's that complicated. I think that yoga is just a product of cross-cultural communication. And what the yoga that's practiced in Los Angeles, Brooklyn, Portland, Seattle, is not the kind of yoga that's practiced at Hindu temples. I mean, let's let's be real. These are, you know, millennial, um, you know, kombucha drinking <laughs> vegetarians go in and it's just like it's it's part of their kind of like secular ritual it, it's it's stripped of all religious significance it it's not a religious activity and uh, frankly matt walsh's argument is ridiculous like this is just a fun little thing that millennials yeah, no, worshiping moloch exercise. is a fun little thing no it's really fun to yeah just <laughs> kneel down before baphomet it's so fun and little i do agree with you uh, most of these people are just doing this sort of silly yeah. thing on their way between yeah. kombucha breaks but uh, right. nevertheless the point of yoga is that the physical is spiritual and the spiritual is enfleshed and there is a relation here. And uh, everybody's got to serve somebody. I think a lot of people can pretend that they're totally independent. They're totally liberated. They're above themselves, above it all, floating in this ethereal world. And don't, it's okay if I do something with my body or if I uh, partake in certain activities. That has no spiritual significance or metaphorical significance or moral significance, but they're fooling themselves because uh, these uh, cultural culture is insidious, right? Politics is downstream of culture, and what you uh, culture and cult come from the same root, and uh, it, there's a relationship between what we do in our culture and the sort of things that we uh, think about the world and the sort of things that we worship as a society, and that relationship should not be uh, downplayed too much. But uh, listen, guys. This has been a lovely panel. It was even nice having Josh, even having you here. It was very, uh, very insightful from both of you. Thank you for being here. We have Josh Yasma and Amanda Prestigiacomo. We have got to get to this day in history. But first, before we can do any of that, I've got to talk to you about Skillshare. So listen, I clearly need to bone up on some of my skills. I, I don't know anything about foreign policy, so I've got to call Josh Yasma. I don't know much about uh, feminism, and I certainly don't want to, so I'll call up Amanda Presta Giacomo. But this uh, time of culture, this time in uh, industry, you need a side hustle. You need to have a lot of skills. This isn't the old days where you would work at the plant for 60 years and retire with a nice pension. So I know. It's the, it's a new year. It's a new year. It's a new you, man. I think everybody has already ditched most of their New Year's resolutions, but hey, maybe you should uh, take this one up so you can actually learn something. Skillshare is an online learning platform with over 18,000 classes in design, business, technology, and more. You can take classes in graphic design, social media marketing, illustration, mobile photography, anything. I'm doing one on uh, time management because I need to, I actually need to find more time to finish that class, but hopefully that will uh, fix itself once I'm finished. Uh, whether you are trying to deepen your professional skill set, start a side hustle, or just explore a new passion, Skillshare is there to keep you learning and thriving. It is really a, a, a great resource. In the old days, you used to have to leave your couch, and if you wanted to learn something, you have to find somebody to go to a classroom. Now you don't have to do any of that. This is the 21st century. Take advantage of it. Um, 
You can join the millions of students who are already learning on Skillshare today with a special offer just for my listeners. This is a great offer, and if you don't take it, you're a dummy. And if you're a dummy, then you should start looking at Skillshare so that you get smarter. Uh, you can get two months of Skillshare for just 99 cents. That is practically free. That is right. Uh, Skillshare is offering Michael Knowles Show listeners two months of unlimited access to over 18,000 classes for just 99 cents. You can't complain that you don't know how to do something or you you haven't learned something. You are getting virtually endless knowledge virtually for free. Do it. To sign up, go to Skillshare.com slash Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L. Again, go to Skillshare.com slash Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, to start your two months now. That, what is it, Marshall? Skillshare.com slash Michael. Skillshare.com slash Michael. Okay, I have got to say goodbye to Facebook and YouTube. Before we get to this day in history, this is a good this day in history. This is a providential this day in history because it's Ronald Reagan's birthday and the announcement of the Reagan Doctrine for my 100th episode. But if you are on Facebook and YouTube, I'm sorry, folks. you got to go to dailywire.com. You, we've enjoyed having you. You're probably not watching on YouTube because they keep punishing us, but that's a story for another day. So go to dailywire.com. What do you get? You get me. You get the Andrew Clavin Show. You get the Ben Shapiro Show. You get the conversation, which I'm going to be in. It's coming up, folks, and it's around Valentine's Day, so we can get a little lovey-dovey, just you and me. Ask the love doctor all of your questions, and I will answer them for you and probably give you terrible advice. So you get all of that. That's great. Forget about it. You get the leftist tears tumbler. Look, the Obama economy is tanking. I don't know if I've said this enough. The Obama economy, for which Barack Obama is the sole responsible party and Donald Trump has nothing to do with it, it is tanking and you're going to need these leftist tears tumbler to store it. Obviously, uh, you're not going to have a lot of money to buy it, so get it now <laughs> before the uh, the markets go completely to trash. So it is the leftist tears tumbler. You can get your leftist tears hot or cold, always salty and delicious. Go to dailywire.com. We'll be right back. It's time for This Day in History. This Day in History. Because nature is but art unknown to thee, and chance direction which thou canst not see, on our hundredth episode on This Day in History in 1911, Ronald Reagan was born. And on this very same day in 1985, Ronald Reagan announced his foreign policy program, the Reagan Doctrine, which has been badly misunderstood by his political descendants. So Ronald Reagan uh, was uh, born, born a good American boy. He, uh, he grew up uh, and became a star of film and television. He, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I've lost my place. He was, oh yes, he was called a dunce by the left and self-appointed elite conservatives alike. He entered the Oval Office in an advanced age. He was divorced and remarried. He fought cultural battles from the White House. He frequently added provocative lines to his speeches that drove his advisors crazy. He affected tax cuts and deregulation at home and strength abroad. And he restored America's leadership in the world after a disastrous Democrat administration. Yeah, that's where I was. That's what I, that's what I couldn't find. That sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? That must be deja vu. I don't know. On this day in 1985, on his birthday, Reagan articulated the foreign policy strategy that would come to be known as the Reagan Doctrine. He explained, quote, freedom is not the sole prerogative of a chosen few. It is a universal right of all God's children. He went on, we must stand by our democratic allies and we must not break faith with those who are risking their lives on every continent from Afghanistan to Nicaragua to defy Soviet supported aggression and secure rights which have been ours from birth. Support for freedom fighters is self defense. These lines have regularly been ridiculed in the wake of September 11th, as we now fight groups of radical Muslims who appear similar to some of the freedom fighters we once supported, even though really that point isn't even true. There's this left-wing suggestion that we uh, funded Osama bin Laden in the 1980s. That's patently false. But Reagan's words are entirely true. Unfortunately, they're usually quoted out of context. The freedom fighters risked their lives to defy Soviet-supported aggression to defy communism, our, our mortal enemy. The, the Reagan doctrine does not exist in the ether floating above reality, above time and space. The Reagan doctrine guided the country to its victory in the Cold War. We won the Cold War. Ronald Reagan won the Cold War. And now we're here. And we can long for the days of Ronald Reagan. The Gipper was a great man and the 1980s were a great time. In many ways, it was more uh, sophisticated and it was more polite and it was more civilized. 
But now we're in a different time with different priorities and different challenges and different political leaders. Applying strategies outside of their time and context can prove disastrous, as we've seen in several interventions. Longing for the good old days is the sign of a decadent culture. A healthy culture moves forward. Ronald Reagan didn't try to solve the problems of Chester Arthur or Grover Cleveland. So too, we should honor the Reagan legacy by living in our own time and space and applying his guiding principles along with timeless philosophy and enduring tradition to the challenges we face today. To quote two great men, that's the only way that we'll ever make America great again. That's our show. That's our hundredth show. Thank you for being here. Thanks for watching for these hundred shows. I appreciate it. I haven't been fired yet by Shapiro. That's really nice. We'll see what happens before the 200th episode. <laughs> really, it kind of worries me. Is it, can I affect the space time continuum or anything? Well, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Please download this and send it to your friends and uh, leave five star reviews. And that will hopefully keep me out of the dumpster doing, doing unsavory things. This is the Michael Knowles show. I am Michael Knowles. Please come back tomorrow. We'll do it all again. The Michael Knowles Show is produced by Marshall Benson. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Senior producer, Jonathan Hay. Supervising producer, Mathis Glover. Our technical producer is Austin Stevens. Edited by Alex Zingaro. Audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Overa. The Michael Knowles Show is a Daily Wire Forward Publishing production. Copyright Forward Publishing 2018.